Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Your Gene Health PRC annual results for the year ended 31st of March 2021 investor presentation. Throughout this presentation, investors will be in listen only mode. Questions are encouraged and can be submitted at any time via the Q&A tab situated on the right hand corner of the screen. Just click Q&A, uh, go to the bottom and type your question and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question received during the meeting itself. However, the company review all questions submitted today and publish responses where it's appropriate to do so. These will be available via your Investor Meet Company dashboard and you'll be notified once these are ready for your review. I'd also like to remind you this presentation is being recorded. And before we begin, we'd like to submit the following poll. I'd now like to hand you over to Lynn Rees, CEO and Barry Hextel, CFO of Your Gene Health PLC. Good afternoon. Good afternoon and thank you, Paul, and, and welcome everyone to uh, to the update today. As always, we really appreciate your time uh, and energy in, uh, in allowing us to go through this slide deck with you. Um, so I'm just going to start off by introducing myself. For those of you who don't know, my name is Lynn. I'm your group CEO. Um, this is my third year uh, anniversary now at, at your gene. And joining me today for the presentation is our CFO, Barry Hextel. Can you say hello, Barry? Thanks, Lynn. Yes. Hello, everybody. Nice to talk to you again. I've been with the business now since 2015 and um, looking forward to running you through the, the last year that we've been through. Excellent. Thank you. So we're going to start, um, everyone, with the um, the first slide up here, which really talks about the... Um, oh, hold on a minute. Let me get the full screen up. Which really talks about the resilience and our investment that we made towards the end of last year. So... As reported in April, our revenues were 18.3 million, um, double digit uh, despite the pandemic, but not obviously where we were hoping to, to, to land as an organization. If you look at our three year CAGR, you will see that's at 44% um, in spite of last year's 10% uh, um, growth. Uh, I'm delighted to, to let you know that today we are, we're seeing a return to form for all our core business growing back at the rates that we would seen and we're getting used to before the pandemic. So um, a lot of that uh, performance last year was made up from strong European NIPT growth. I think I've spoken to you before about where we had customers with installations. We grew all of that business. Uh, the total growth for that segment was 38%. We are an NIPT business. Just to see that part of our business growing through the most challenging of circumstances was very, very pleasing. But as I shared with you before, big challenge asking new customers to switch off their labs um, whilst we went in and commissioned new machinery, trained their staff. Uh, and that was the sort of story of last year. So, so good momentum with our current customers, good growth, as we would expect to see the adoption rates of NIPT increasing year on year, but a bit challenging with regard to the new business. Um, we hedged that with some COVID, um, and we'll talk a little bit more later on about how we're progressing with those plans. Um, gross profit was up 11% to 11.4 million, and we nudged our margin over the 62% mark. Um, we obviously acquired Coastal Genomics last year, as well as X5 Genomics, and I'll be giving you some updates on the progress that we made with those businesses um, a bit later on in the, in the presentation. Um, but as we came to the last quarter last year, and um, we had a, quite a challenging set of circumstances, we had a range of revenues that we were still hoping to achieve. We saw some big potential contracts and wins out there, um, but the timing of those were very difficult to confirm um, because of the pandemic. Um, and then we had a series of investment opportunities that, you know, come our way. And as, as a board, we decided to back ourselves. We could have bunkered down and decided not to spend money to ride out the, um, you know, the pandemic like a lot of organizations have done. Um, but we didn't do that as an organization. We kept with our numbers in the city. Um, we didn't pull any guidance. And we decided to make some investment decisions at the end of last quarter um, with the hope that it would put us in a really strong position and even stronger position strategically this year to deliver. So we put a bit more money into the transition of Iona NX. Um, that's difficult to, to transition when you're doing it remotely. So we needed more consultant support on site in customer. We needed dual systems running side by side in the UK and, and wherever we were installing to make sure that we had the, the, the right level of support from our customers. We had significant COVID opportunities presented to us. We had the opportunity to compete in the government bio microbiological uh, framework. Um, and to, in order to do that, that would have meant bringing live samples into our organization and bringing even more capacity to the company. Um, so we decided to back ourselves because we wanted to go for that uh, framework. We felt we were in a very strong position to provide good quality service and best in class products. Um, so we made some investment decisions at the end of the year, which Barry will talk through in a lot more detail later on in the presentation that fundamentally um, impacted the profitability. 
you wouldn't have noticed that if we'd have hit a higher revenue number towards the last quarter, um, but we didn't. Um, but we decided to still carry on with the investment strategy, fully believing um, in the long-term future growth prospects of this business, which we feel we have you know, further enhanced. In addition to that investment, we also took a hard look at costs. You know, as we're becoming a more localized business with a resource, both commercial, operational and technical, being deployed in the core markets that we're trying to um, deliver in, um, it became clear that it was, you know, part of our business, which was overstaffed. So um, we've led a, a cost base refocusing uh, in the first half of this year, and we targeted at, at £1 million pounds worth of annualised savings. Again, Barry will give you a bit more granularity on that, uh, but we're making good progress on that. Um, and I think the, the, the summary of that then um, is now showing that we're getting great returns. So our first quarter... Um, which is always the lowest quarter of our year. We don't really suffer from seasonal variation, but our first quarter is always our lowest quarter. Um, we've delivered over £6 million worth of revenue. So that's up 80% year on year. And more importantly, for all of those people who are worried about when we're going to make some profitability in this organisation, that delivered £0.7 million worth of EBITDA. Um, unaudited at the moment, so that number could go up a little bit. Um, but we were very, very pleased with the performance in the first quarter. And to break that down into a little bit more detail, um, we had a fantastic June with COVID. Um, you know, the government pretty much shut us off at the end of last year. You know, the big fourth quarter we were planning was certainly um, handcuffed by the fact that we were all put in lockdown just before Christmas. So we saw the market opening up again in, in, in April. We saw some increases in COVID testing in May. And then we had a really, really strong June number. Um, but also, as well as the COVID growth, we saw the core products, the NIPT products, the reproductive healthcare products, like our cystic fibrosis range, return into form uh, and all of those grew 30 percent year on year versus the previous quarter um, we delivered some significant us wins um, in terms of new contracts we onboarded two nipt customers in the us and two new customers for our range of technology coming out of coastal genomics i'm not able to disclose who those customers are because they want to keep their strategic plans on hold until they're ready to announce them but I can tell you that they are serious, serious players, uh, blue chip organizations that will really help us accelerate our, our footprint into the US. And all of those growth levers are working really well together, um, despite some of the challenges that we still found um, in the APAC region, in the Middle East region, which relies on a lot of health tourism and with travel corridors still shut down. We haven't seen the same return to form in those parts of the industry. But I think that goes to show what a balanced, diversified mix of products and customers we have now that allows us to be able to deliver a result like this um, in these kind of challenges. In terms of outlook for Q2, um, I think we're incredibly well positioned to benefit from ongoing COVID opportunities. Um, you know, I said we had a good June, that was beaten by July. Um, I'm looking at the run rate in August, July will be beaten by August. So I think as we head into this summer holiday period or we're in this summer holiday period now, but obviously I've only shared with you what we did up until June, we're very confident with the direction of travel from a COVID perspective. Um, as I've mentioned already, our core products have returned to strength. Um, the world has adapted and is learning to live with COVID. Um, and, and we're not in the throes of the, of the early pandemic, um, which was causing just chaos everywhere. So a return to form of the core markets um, and this US penetration building some quite nice momentum in that key market. So my expectation would be um, a strong Q2. And then if you layer on top of that, the fact that we are active and live in four tenders as part of the government framework so the way that framework works is once you've been awarded the framework and an ability to participate in it um, there's a tender process so anybody who wants to procure a product or a service you know as it runs a tender um, we are active in four of those tenders and if timing had been different i may be updating you today on some of those so read into that what you will but um, i'm sure we'll be updating you in the near term so to summarize on this slide i think the group has established a much broader technology platform um, which was one of the key objectives when I joined the business three years ago. Our demand base is truly global um, and we're very well positioned to, to return to normalized levels of growth. And I've read some of the chat rooms and I, I listened to some of the comments. This isn't jam tomorrow. This is happening now. Our first quarter is a record breaking quarter, 80% up year on year. And I'm very confident in terms of the performance of Q2. As I've mentioned a couple of times already, three year anniversary. So, so this slide, I think, is, is, is a bit of a summary slide for me. Um, when I joined the organization, we were in 20 countries. We had a, a, a small and, and, and 
stretched headquarters in Manchester. We had one product, NIPT, on Thermo Fisher. We had litigation. We had debt. If we look at the snapshot of the business today, uh, we're truly a global, global company. We sell into 60 countries, either directly or through very established distributor networks. We have a wide range of products, so you know much more SKUs in our portfolio. Um, Stradlin Oncology, infectious disease, a wider range of reproductive healthcare products to sit alongside NIPT. NIPT is sold on both Illumina and the Thermo Fisher sequencing platforms. It covers about 90% of the global addressable market. We've been successful in developing our own products organically, Claragene, our COVID response, DPYD, which is still saving a couple of lives in every 100 people that are tested, came from in-house. But we've also been successfully um, utilizing the funds that we can raise on, on the markets um, to buy a new technology and customers. Um, so the business that you see today, that picture is our headquarters in Manchester. We have a similar facility in Taiwan. Um, we've got facilities in Singapore and US and about to make an investment into our facility in Vancouver as that business grows. So a truly global business um, and a business that's achieved a 44% revenue, revenue CAGR over that year. And I'm sure Barry's going to take a little bit of time later to explain some more of that detail. Um, in terms of sort of product mix, I'm sure all of you are keen to understand what is the makeup of, of our products, because a lot of you would have been invested in this NIPT opportunity and the story that we've been selling for the last couple of years of, 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 of the market really adapting and, and growing to this technology. Some of you may have joined for, because of the COVID story. So I think this picture really does demonstrate where we are as a business. We break our products and services down into technologies and services. Technologies is basically any product that we put into a customer's hands that they run in their lab. So this includes NIPT, reproductive healthcare products like cystic fibrosis, our COVID assay that we sell to other labs, um, the new range of technology that we got from Coastal as well as DPYD. And you'll see from the graph there, if your eyesight is good enough, that 52% of that revenue comes from NIPT, over 30% comes from reproductive healthcare. So 80% of our product revenue comes from the reproductive space, which is where we said we always wanted to go. We've got two little growing stars then in COVID and um, Ranger and DPYD that all sat around about the 8%. I would expect those to be a bigger percentage next year as those stars become mature products and start to capitalize on the excitement in the marketplace for them. If you look at genomic services, that's where we provide a service. So that's where we run a test in our own lab. And I think if we'd have looked at this split when I joined the organization, it was probably 90% products, 10% service. Um, now, as you can see, it's 65% products, 35% service. And the importance of that is the product side is derived demand. We can sell products to our customers, but we can't guarantee they're going to use them. With genomic services and providing our own service from our own labs, we have a bit more control and a bit more surety around the forecasting. So to see that now at 35% of our revenue, again, is a nod to show how mature we are as a business or how much we have matured. And also the diversification that we have in our product range and our customer base now. And again, you'll see from the split of services, it's pretty equal between NIPT, which we've seen record numbers of NIPT over the last couple of months in the UK off the back of the St. George's tender win. And we've got COVID, which has obviously played an important role last year, set to play more of an important role this year. And then the other part of our business is the range of technology stuff that we do and the pharma stuff that we do as a, as a result of the X5 genomics acquisition. So they're partners like AstraZeneca and Cytox, where we're offering real pharma sequencing services. So again, I ho hopefully that showed to you the maturity of our product range. Um, and I'm going to hand over to Barry now, who will dive into a bit more granularity on those numbers. Over to you, Barry. Thank you, Lynn. Yeah, so the revenue, firstly, um, we'll just walk through the revenues and then the P&L and then the balance sheet and cash flow. So revenues, the geographic mix, um, overall it grew 10%. Geographic mix did change quite a bit. So the UK grew very strongly with um, the boost of, of COVID products and service sales, which are focused on the UK market. Um, Europe grew about 38% year on year. And that was largely our NIPT and DPYD product lines, so very much core business growth. International markets were particularly found it hardest in, in the pandemic. So uh, particularly that's Asia and the Middle East, a lot of travel restrictions to help them manage the virus. I, I don't think they managed it very well, but it, the knock-on effect businesses was difficult. 
um, patients couldn't travel from one country to another for prenatal screening, for example. Um, we couldn't move engineers and, and salespeople around. Um, and a lot of customers and countries were diverting resources to COVID testing. So the international segment um, really bore the brunt of, of the pandemic for us. As a result of that, we've, we've posted an impairment to some goodwill that we'd acquired a business in Taiwan and Singapore in 2017. We think that's prudent balance sheet management, but we're continuing to invest in that part of the world. We see significant growth prospects um, over there as, as those countries emerge from, from the pandemic impacts. The 10% revenue growth, the uh, gross profits grew slightly better than that. We managed to uptick margins just shy of 1%. Um, so continuing the trajectory orbit, not quite at the gradient that, that we'd anticipated or that we'd hoped for. That plays through onto the key financial indicators from the P&L um, for that revenue growth. And uh, as a result of that, not being quite as fast as anticipated, but there was a bit of a, a step back on EBITDA. And so this bridge chart here, um, if you can see my mouse, uh, this is intended to provide as much transparency around what was what's moved, what the moving parts are within EBITDA. Um, and you'll see that in note six of the accounts that we published yesterday. Um, if you want to delve into that in more detail, this is just a representation of note six. So just a very quick walk through. So obviously gross profits increased, not quite at the rate we'd anticipated. So our operating expenditure growth um, sort of underlying was um, fairly equivalent. Uh, with localized, as Lynn said, we've adapted to the different um, travel landscapes. So we have localized a number of activities which did increase OPEX, um, but will give us better resilience going forward. Um, we've taken what we think are prudent positions um, on two or three receivable situations. Each of them is sort of pandemic related. Um, we think they're temporary in nature um, and we, we believe we diligence them and we think that they can reverse in the current financial year or at least sort of more than half of that figure should reverse in the current financial year. So we think that's a prudent position we've taken. Um, we'll continue to invest in R&D. And then the remainder of this chart is really that what Lynn described earlier, the sort of conscious decisions to continue to invest in the growth of the drivers for the business um, in anticipation that we would be pulling through the pandemic um, and also that travel would be resuming. So if I go through these um, fairly quickly, we increased our expenditure by about a million pounds on our UK laboratory service infrastructure. That's additional people, it's additional equipment installations, equipment maintenance, consumables for the laboratory. That's largely predicated on COVID, building capacity to, to do COVID testing. Obviously the travel wasn't opening up by the year, year end for us, but that has now started to come through in the first quarter, um, as you can see from, from our announcement. Um, so that lab infrastructure is significantly enhanced. We've done it in a way, or we're trying to do it in a way that gives us extra capability even when COVID recedes if COVID recedes, but um, that, that that infrastructure is, is very much geared to a, an expanded laboratory service offering through our Eology and Genomic Services Division. Next one, Iona NX. This is the transition of our NIPT um, core product over to the Illumina-based sequencing platform. Um, we've transitioned a lot, all of our key customers in Europe. They're now active. The travel restrictions uh, did make for a bit more um, hands-on support for customers than we'd anticipated, um, but that's still a very worthwhile investment in that platform because that really, we've got, with the Illumina sequencing system, we've got a much broader addressable market uh, globally for that platform. So it's very important to get it bedded in properly. Business systems, we're investing in business systems. We want to scale the business rapidly. Um, as you know, that we want to do that in a controlled manner. And so we're investing in um, sort of ERP and integrated with a CRM system. Uh, we had originally thought that would be a capital expenditure. But some changes to IFRS rules around cloud services meant that we put that through the operating expenditure line. And then the final chart on bar on here is about US market entry. Those significant contracts that we announced early this new financial year were you know, long in the making in the back end of the last financial year. And so we wanted to articulate that that's where some of the OPEX was, was being um, directed. And all of those we feel will bear fruit in the future and are already starting to do so. Um, 
So we, we feel that they were sort of sensible investments, albeit the headline EBITDA went the wrong direction. If I move on to the impact for the balance sheet and cash flow quickly. So the balance sheet you see over the last four years, significant investment in non-current assets. That's intangible assets through acquisitions. Um, but it's also in the last year we spent three million pounds on upgrading the UK laboratories, upgrading our Taiwanese laboratory facility, and also in installing reagent rental workflows with this Illumina instrumentation in Europe to transition those key accounts. Um, again, all of those we see as revenue generating assets. I think if you look at the cash flow progression over the last four years, the first couple of years, really the cash flow was we were an early stage development company. We weren't a critical mass. We were consuming cash basically to keep the lights on or keep the business moving. In the last couple of years, the focus has moved much more to investing in growth drivers for the business, um, whether that's balance sheet um, investments or whether that's OPEX investments. We're very much targeted at that, those investing activities on the cash flow statement. Hope that makes sense. Feel free to log any questions on the Q&A uh, and I'll hand back to Lynn. Thank you, Barry. And um, I'm great to see you guys. Quite a few questions coming through as well. Um, so I'm, I've been told by my wife and three daughters I'm the worst multitasker in my house. So I will try and pick some of these off as we're going through the presentation because I think it does cover off some of the points. But if not, we'll address them as we get to the end um, of the deck. OK, so. In terms of, of our acquisition updates, uh, you know, I mentioned earlier we bought um, Coastal Genomics. We knew that business. We knew it quite well. We'd been working with them for three years. So no surprises. The integration of that has gone very, very well. And um, there was a key milestone for them to get as part of the ratchet deal that we negotiated to supply uh, to sign two master supply agreements with blue chip organizations. I'd love to tell you who they who they are. They will become public at some point, um, and you'll be very pleased with the, with the names that are, are, are provided alongside that. So we've delivered those first two um, supply agreements. Our key focus now is to making sure we have enough capacity in Vancouver to deliver the reagents for those machines um, that we placed. So uh, the milestone earnouts were triggered, um, and we are using the base in, in Vancouver to bring product into America. So one of the challenges we had last year was just getting product into customs and, uh, and into the states everything was kind of on hold so having a stock of products in vancouver that we can sh you know ship rather quickly from vancouver into the us is proving to be a, a good strategy in addition there's a good flow of products coming uh, the other side as well so the range of technology which relies on the light bench that's the hardware you sell in um, we're seeing light bench sales now pretty much um, consistently each month in europe and apac um, so we're pleased at the direction of travel. The, the team in, in, in Canada has grown from nine to, I think overall in the US and Canada, we're about 20 people now. So we're starting to have some serious feet on the ground and starting to make some serious uh, traction. Um, X5 Genomics, um, now branded your, your Gene Genomics Services. We acquired that business. Um, that was a much easier integration from Liverpool to Manchester. Um, so that's all been completed. Um, the CRO clients that include the likes of, of Cytox and AstraZeneca, are all transferred across. And as you saw in the revenue split earlier, we're starting to make some good gains um, with that business. I think the key for me with, with the X5, though, is the team that we bought. We bought some real, real specialized and, and, and high energy, high talent people that have really helped to shape our COVID offering, um, you know, high throughput government contracts and the like. The experience that we bought when we brought that group in has, has, has really helped us position ourselves, I think, in, in terms of COVID. And I'll, I'll come on to that in a couple of slides time. So very, very pleased with the acquisitions um, that we bought uh, and pleased with the way they're bedding in. Um, in terms of future you know, core business, um, Barry's already taken you through how we invested at the latter stages of last year. We will continue to invest in NIPT. Um, it's such an interesting product, you know, and, and to see the growth rate, even in lockdown, of installed customer bases really underlines the, 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 the strategy that we expect more mums to choose this type of test as opposed to the, the more routine test or, or, or old fashioned test each year, we'll expect those adoption curves to increase and they certainly did within COVID. So we're gonna put some more money to make sure that we keep our content up to date. You know, there are over 2000 genes you can actually identify um, in a fetus. We only look at three at the moment. So there's room for, for growth uh, as the market becomes more aware of genetic testing. And I think that is a journey that the market has been accelerated on as a result of COVID. Um, we all now know what PCR tests are. We all now know what lateral flow tests are. 
uh, and I think the market is much more switched on um, in terms of future genetic testing. Um, we've also been in investing in the commercial team and we will continue to, to make those investments both from a regulatory perspective to make sure we can sell the product in those territories and to make sure we have pairs of hands that can sell the product um, when we're ready to go. In terms of the Ranger Tech, as already explained, this is all about making sure we have enough capacity in our Vancouver facility um, to be able to deliver the expected demand that the two blue chip customers we've signed up um, will bring. There's also quite a decent pipeline of, of additional opportunities with Ranger Tech, specifically in the US. Um, this technology, uh, just to re refresh everyone's minds, is about screening more products more quickly, more cheaply. So buying this in the sweet spot of a COVID pandemic um, you know, is almost a perfect storm for this technology. So we've got quite a long pipeline of, of interested parties that are, that are keen to work on us to improve their cost base and to improve their throughput. Um, and of course, it's, it's the fact that this technology sits on our NIPT solution and no one else has access to that that gives us a good differentiator when we look at breaking into new markets like we're trying to do in Europe, Asia and America. Um, in terms of the COVID opportunity, so as we spoke about last year, I think the first step that I give you, we were building capacity for 2,000 pieces a month. That went to 5,000 pieces a month. I think we finished last year telling you we could do 20,000 pieces a month. Um, we did 22,000 tests last week. Um, just to give you an idea of the scale we're at now. We say our capacity is conservatively about 100,000, but I suspect it's more like 150. And we have commissioned a second set of automated machines as part of that investment that Barry took you through. Um, that can be installed within a three-day period should we see additional demand on top of the demand that we're forecasting at the moment. We spent a lot of time last year setting up a portfolio of partners. We didn't back one customer or opportunity. We work with a range of partners that have deep roots into retail. So for example, you know, myhealthcheck.com has this fantastic relationship with Boots um, that is delivering many, many products for us. And I'll point out it's not our product that's out of stock in Boots at all. Um, we've got good routes with MPH um, that, that service the airlines and work with airlines such as KLM. Um, we get tests coming in from Heathrow, film sets, sporting events. So we've built a good network um, of, 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 of sample harvesters, for want of another word. And we've seen that increase significantly since the lockdown. You know, January to, to April was, was hardly anything came through. May we saw an uplift. June, no doubt, spurred on by the Euros and, and various other events opening up. We saw a significant uplift. That was beaten by July. That will be beaten in August. Um, so we anticipate that COVID testing will be with us at least until the end of this calendar year. Um, I believe that, that, that you know, PCR testing is now the gold standard. PCR testing. Um, we've had a question posted around pricing. I'm not worried about the £49 price. Our price is under that already. Um, I've told you before, we've got a very, very unique offering. We use our own products. We don't buy anybody else's product in. We use our own test in our own lab. And if we get positive results, we send them to our sequences in our own lab. So we control a lot of our cost. We can be very reactive um, and we provide gold standard service because normally we're telling mums about potential genetic risks with their babies. So we follow very, very high regulatory standards and those standards are being followed by our COVID team. We've got great partners and I think this will become a long-term revenue for us. Um, you may ask the question, well, what happens if COVID goes away? And this is probably the reason we made the investment in the framework that we did, because now our systems are capable of talking to the PHE and the NHS. So our laboratory information systems, our LIM systems, will communicate with those entities. So if and when COVID does eventually become more normalized, we are still gonna be in the race for other viruses. And there are many viruses that the government tests for, and also put us in the frame to try and win oncology testing and the like. So I think we've invested in a long-term strategic driver. It was never part of the original thesis. We've adapted as a result of COVID. We've given ourselves a great short-term um, product opportunity and service opportunity, which you're seeing come through in the numbers now. And I think on top of that, we have the potential to add some other additional business through these government frameworks. I, I've told you we're active on four lots at the moment. We're actively in a tender process. Um, and that is a three-year contract. And, and you know, we're a couple of months into that. So I think that will continue to bring opportunity for us for years to come. And more importantly, give us a real good link with the NHS and PHE moving forward. Uh, because there's many things that we can do for those organizations. And once we demonstrate how efficacious and how high quality our services, 
I'm sure there'll be follow up opportunity there. So COVID was a hedge for us last year. It's a bona fide revenue stream for us this year. I'm not going to make the same mistake and get all excited about the numbers and share that with you in advance of landing them. So our plan is in the AGM in September to come back to the table, give you a clear view on what happened in July and August. I've given you a direction of travel today, give you a clear view on any government uh, tenders that we've run through that framework, um, if we are successful in winning any, uh, and give you an idea on, uh, as to what those numbers are looking like. And then working with the analysts um, to, to plot and update our numbers because our numbers didn't include any COVID uh, for the second half of this year and certainly nothing after that. And I think it's time that we probably, um, you know, with the knowledge that we have over the last 18 months, update those numbers. So you'll hear from us when we win any more contracts over the next couple of months, uh, weeks, sorry, and you'll hear from us at the end of September in the AGM where we will give you much more detail. But hopefully, I can't see you, but I'm hoping you're pleased with the progress that we're making there. As I said, 80% up in the first quarter, second quarter looking even stronger. Um, in terms of geographic reach, we, we talked about having a global play and the diversification it brings. You know, one of our challenges in APAC was we had very one very large customer that just switched off um, as a result of COVID and, and averted all their attention to COVID as opposed to oncology. So when I look at the UK at, at the geographic footprint today for the organization. Delighted to see that, um, you know, a DPYD is now available in every NHS trust in Wales. If you're newly diagnosed with cancer in Wales, you get a DPYD test. Um, we're in most of the trusts in England. We've gone into Belgium, into Germany. We're getting into France. We won the Iona and Extender win with St. George's. Um, we're seeing record numbers of NIPT samples coming through in the UK now, um, both from our partnership with St. George's, but also sent directly to our labs in Manchester. And as I've mentioned multiple times, we won the PHE framework. We were one of only three companies to be awarded um, successful wins in all four lots. Um, and that's a multi-billion pound contract spread over the next three years. APAC, we've put some new salespeople in Vietnam and Taiwan. We've also regreened some of our distributors there. We've had approval for Iona NX from the TGA in Australia. Um, and we expect approval for our cystic fibrosis product to follow shortly. And we've got a brand new installation coming in Japan. We spoke about this before, it's a blue chip. It's been a little bit delayed. There was um, some insignificant event called the Olympics, which got in the way of our installation, um, which uh, unfortunately is now over. So we're looking to, to, to go into Japan, COVID willing, at the end of October and start installing that system. In Europe, uh, we appointed AGBL. They're Illumina's extra distributor, so they know the market very well. They know our product very well. They're going to take on the Middle East and Africa for us. Um, Iona and X is transitioning brilliantly in France, as, as you saw in France and UK, 38% growth. We've also got new systems in Spain, in Italy, in Germany, in Switzerland. Um, we're looking to put some in, in the Scandinavian territories as well. So we're starting to see um, an improvement in, in terms of being able to access new customers and being able to deploy our team to install new systems. And we continue to strengthen the commercial team within region, um, commercial resource and marketing resource to support the product efforts in the market. I've left America to the last because that was always my key focus, biggest healthcare market in the world. And we didn't even you know, have a dollar revenue in it up until 12 months ago. Um, we're now 20 people in the US, led by Scott Sargent, a very experienced, very high caliber commercial guy. Ex Kyogen, ex Illumina, knows the market really, really well. We've appointed probably two of the largest US labs already on our range of technology. And we've got a long pipeline of existing opportunities to work through. But that's enough of endorsement on the technology to tell me that I need to invest in a facility to make more reagents. We've got two NIPT accounts, one in the West Coast, one in the East Coast, both very, very well-known entities. One already routinely collecting many, many NIPT samples that will be switching to our system from October. And the second is probably America's largest genetic testing laboratory. Um, and we look forward to installing their NIPT system in the first quarter of next year and seeing the revenue coming through in the three years after that. So I think geographically, um, again, if you look at where we were three years ago and the progress we made, in spite of the fact that I haven't left South Wales for, for close to a year now, um, is, is I'm really, really proud of the progress that we've made in, in some quite difficult circumstances. So bringing all of that together, um, 21 was a year of investment. We adapted and we still grew. Uh, we didn't go backwards. We didn't pull our guidance. It would have been easy to do that. Um, and we struck to our strategic plan. And again, some quite difficult circumstances, as Barry described, we were brave with our investment decisions. And I think we're seeing that um, already coming back with the delivery of the first quarter. 
the future will rely on the on the realization of these investments. So I hope the fact that you'll see the core business um, returning to, to normal growth rates, what's happening with the way that the iOwner NX has been adopted by our customer base. The wave that Ranger technology has caused in the US, but we weren't really well known, but we are now certainly on people's radars. The strong commercial teams we brought in, not just in the US, but in APAC, in Europe, are really, really supporting the drive and, and the commitment to, to, to grow sales. And then we've got this brilliant COVID franchise now that we, we use our own product that has been resilient against all the variants that have come into the market. We use our own lab. We're now three shifts, working 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We've taken capacity from 2,000 to somewhere north of 200,000 by we finish, by the time we finish this summer. We're not under pressure from a price perspective because we manage and control all our, all our own supply chain, and we're not the expensive part of the supply chain. The service revenue is a higher revenue, so it's more like a PCR margin, so it's more 80%, whereas the NGS is more 60%, so it's accretive from a revenue perspective. We're already seeing significant growth. We expect to see more significant growth in the second quarter. And if we can overlay with some government contracts from the framework, which, as I say, we are very active in at present, um, then, as I said, this becomes a bona fide revenue stream all on its own this year, which is why we, we need to sit down um, and reshape the future forecasts of the business. So to, 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 to end that, we're an established platform, I believe. We built a really, really strong foundation. I do read the chat rooms. Um, I'd like to meet some of you sometimes to have some of those discussions face to face. But, um, you know, the themes that I pick up jam today, was it, and it, when's it coming, Lynn? Well, we've grown from 6 million. When I arrived, we did 6 million in the first year. We just smashed that out in the first quarter. And we're more excited about the second quarter than the first quarter. We're selling our products in 60 countries worldwide. We have a range of products that we can deploy now. So if people aren't deciding to get pregnant because they're in lockdown, we can sell them infectious disease tests. When the governments are ready across the world to pick up oncology and do what they should be doing with oncology testing, we're ready to support that. So I think this business is in a very, very strong position. I'm delighted to share with you those first quarter results that really hopefully reinforce that message. Um, and what I suggest we do now is maybe hand back to Paul to do a little bit of housekeeping and then uh, myself and Barry will pick up the questions that have already been pre-submitted and the new ones that are coming through. That's great. Fantastic. Lynn, Barry, thanks indeed for, for such a positive update as well. Um, ladies and gentlemen, do please continue to submit your questions using the Q&A tab situated on the right hand corner of your screen. Just simply click Q&A, uh, go to the bottom of the screen, type in your question and press send. Um, but just while the team take a few moments to review the questions that have been submitted during today's event, I'd like to remind you the recording of the presentation along with a copy of the slides and the published Q&A can be accessed via your investor dashboard on the Investor Meet company platform. I'd also like to remind you that your feedback is important to the company and immediately after the presentation has ended, you will be redirected for the opportunity to provide your feedback in order that the team can better understand your views and expectations. Lynn Barry, um, Lynn, as you said, you had a number of pre-submitted questions, which I think I'll probably hand back to you to, to run through if I may. And once we've done that, if I could just ask you to click on that Q&A tab, because we've had quite a few questions as well come through during the live event. Um, and if you could just read them out and give your responses, that would be fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, and we try and get through as many as we, as, we, as we can. I don't want to dodge any questions, guys. You know how open I am. So I'll start. Um, we split up the pre-submitted questions. So, Barry, I'll, I'll ask you to answer a couple, OK? So the first question we had was, Lynn, have you got enough time to do this, given your commitments with Amazon and MHC? I think I've explained this before. I commit to one day a month with Amazon and MHC. Um, they're areas of, of the market that I've got a lot of expertise in, 20 years in lateral flow. And MHC is one of our biggest customers at the moment. So, yeah, I'm happy to give them one day a month. Will it impact what I do for your gene or them? Absolutely not. Uh, and I'm very comfortable. I won't be taking up any more NED roles in the future, though, just in case anyone was wondering about that. Um, we had a question why I don't think it is my place to discuss the share price. As the CEO of a listed company, you have fiduciary obligations to maximize value for the company shareholders. Increasing market cap by continual dilution does not support retail investors that support you. Will you commit to consider share price increase as a strategic objective? Barry. Um, well, firstly, with my company secretary hat, I'll answer the question. Um, so our fiduciary duties to all stakeholders of the business, and certainly we're seeing in small cap world that there's a lot, a lot bigger emphasis from investors on environmental, social and governance matters. So we, we do have to take account of all stakeholders. Within that, so get off the soapbox, that within that, shareholders are a very important stakeholder to the business, and, and we are very 
uh, passionate about trying to articulate what we're doing as a business and trying to find as many routes to get that message across. We understand that retail investors sometimes feel they don't get the same amount of information as institutions. And we try very hard to make sure that's not the case. And, and that's what this is about. Um, this session is also about the, the short video that we posted yesterday with the RNS. So um, there was a sort of real time update yesterday and this session is scheduled amongst several institutional investor meetings that follows exactly the same course. Um, in terms of share price, the last sort of part of this, um, we, we can't, we don't know who's buying and selling shares. Um, we don't have any more visibility than anybody else. Anyone can rest, you know, look at registrar, uh, ask the registrar for a share register. Lots of people hold them as nominee holders. We, we don't know any more than you do. So we do get a number of investors saying who's selling or who's buying. You know, we, we have no more information than, than you do on that. We obviously like to try and understand what's going on, but we, we can't answer that question to you because we shouldn't. Um, there's a Chinese wall there. Um, and if we, even if we did know, we shouldn't say. Um, in terms of what's happening with market cap and dilution, um, absolutely, we've been on a, an M&A uh, journey that has led to um, a significant dilution. Our, our aim now, we've got good liquidity in the business. Um, we're not looking to come back to the markets unless there was a transformative acquisition. Um, but fundamentally, we're hoping that the plan is that to use the COVID situation to generate significant liquidity for the business, that we can then move from low multiple COVID activities to high multiple genomic services and technologies um, activities. So, um, you know, never say never in terms of coming back to the markets for dilution, but that's not a, a focus of what we're doing now. I think the stage that we're at with the business, we could maybe carry some debt. Um, certainly if we can drive some liquidity through the COVID opportunity, then we can um, look to build the, the core business without having to do as, as much dilution as we have in the past. But we do understand that point where, where shareholders too, um, we get diluted when you do. Thank you, Barry. Um, okay, so the next question, what happened to the eight overseas outlets for Claragene tests? Um, they're still there in the background, but we've been focusing very much on ourselves and our UK partners. Um, it's easier to do business in the UK and the easiest solution for us is to use all the tests ourselves in our own labs. And that's certainly what is happening at the moment. Um, why can't the company go direct to use uh, end user to supply the PCR test? Um, well, we've been building the capacity. Um, I don't necessarily want to build call centers that are dealing with people in airports saying, I'm just about to board my flight, where's my certificate? Um, and I don't necessarily want a load of people turning up at our laboratory where, you know, as I said, we ha handle some very sensitive samples um, with their swabs. Um, it's something we could move to if the market dictates it. As I said, I believe we have enough margin in our in our offering to be able to work with a range of, of partners. And we've been successful in that this year, um, spe specifically with my health check. Um, so, um, so yeah, it's something that we could move into the in, into the future, but it's not high on my list of objectives at the moment. I think I've shared with you the capacity and the potential that this is going to bring the business this year. Um, and I think I've, I've done enough investing for the time being um, without, you know, any, any further required. Is there any real mileage in the government framework tenders? Um, yes, I've explained that. We're active in four of them at the moment and they're real tenders. Um, and I look forward to updating you as and when I can. Um, can the company employ a minister so we can get into the VIP fast track lane? Also, does the company have any big brown envelopes? Absolutely not how we do business, which is why we will still be doing business in this space for many, many years to come. Um, okay, future COVID plans. How is the company preparing for the eventual easing of PCR testing in the UK? Um, will there be any overseas PCR sales to take up the slack? Um, I think our laboratory, our laboratory expansion is all about PCR as a whole, not just COVID. So as I said before, I think having the roots into the government frameworks and being able to communicate with their lab systems and their patient record systems will give us a future strategic um, lever to work with here. So I'm not worried about life after COVID. I think there will be plenty of diagnostic tests and opportunities. And I'm delighted to have the opportunity to be able to partner um, the UK government in, in, in some of them. Does the company have any newer versions of the PTR, PCR test up and coming? Um, not nothing yet. We're looking at it. We've had a look at a panel, which would include, you know, flu A, flu B, maybe a SARS. Um, and that's something I think we will continue to monitor. Our immediate key focus is making sure that we satisfy the demand that we see in front of us today. 
Um, okay, question six. Some months ago, it was expected that there will be numerous deals coming from the US. What's happened to them? We did them. Uh, we converted them. I guess one of the frustrations I had around that is because we're often the small partner in these discussions, if you, if you knew who the, the other four partners were in, uh, in those contracts. Um, and they kind of control the pen on, on what they say and when they say it. So you will get to hear about them and you will be suitably impressed when you do. Um, but those deals were done in the first quarter and we are now in uh, deployment and launch phases with all of those customers. Um, so I think that answers all of the present questions. I'm just looking at the list I've got here. So what impact will the proposed cap of £49 on PCR fees have in the business? As I mentioned before, we're way under that price anyway, so not really a challenge for us. And when you control the supply chain, using our own tests, using our own equipment, using our own staff, um, I think we're in a very strong position. Um, what revenue split do you foresee are targeting as a business between tech and services in one and two years time? Uh, that's a really good question. As I said, I'm pleased it went from 90% and a 10% split, 65-35. Feels like a good balance. I could live with anything between, um, you know, that and 50-50, and to be honest. It gives us great diversification. Um, it's always a great backup if our customers go down to be able to, you know, use our own labs to, to support them. And as I said earlier, it's controlling our own destiny. So 50-50 uh, would be ideal, but I take 35-65 for the next two years if that's where we land. Uh, related to tech versus services, is it right to conclude that the latter has higher margins. Yes, services, as I explained earlier, about 80% margins compared to uh, products which are sitting at about 60% um, at the moment. Okay, this is one for you, Barry. Why is investment not capitalized, but an OPEX, especially lab capabilities, infrastructure related? So I love some uh, accounting standards. Um, so there's a, we're using the term investment in this presentation in uh, sort of the general use in terms of spending money for something that's going to deliver a return in the future. Um, under accounting standards, some of those activities are classed as assets, so buying a machine, but then running validation routines, buying consumables to push through that machine to make sure it's, it's operating to the specification that we want would be classed as um, operating expenditure or, or overhead. Um, so that's why we're using the term in the broadest sense, but some of those costs appear in the balance sheet, some appear in the P&L. Thank you, Barry. Do you want to take the next one as well? Impairment of 2017, Goodwill? Yeah, excellent. So um, with Goodwill, what you're testing when we do impairment testing, which we, we have to do every year, um, what you're testing is the business that you acquired in the shape that it was when you acquired it. So the impairment is against that business because things have changed, um, we believe, sort of structurally. But the future prospects for other things that that business can do for us, um, don't you don't include them in the test. So you might, you could equally, you can easily have an impairment on one hand for the business that you acquired, and this is about a fifty percent impairment. So it's not the whole business; it's it's still a very good business, um, but that doesn't reflect. You can at the same time as making that impairment, you can have positive um, aspirations for, for for the new activities that you want to drive through that part of the group. Thank you, Barry. Um, after the payment debacle of Novasight and today's relevation of non-payment by DHSC at Abington, what confidence have we got if we were successful that we'd get paid? Really, really good question. I mean, um, from my view, I think the government were in a difficult position when the pandemic started. They reached out to companies that had the capability or existing products, and they, they, they tried to get their hands on them as quickly as possible. And I think that rush to get those Contracts signed, um, unfortunately, meant organizations like the Good Law Project can have a pop at the government for, for those. I can say that the framework that we entered was, was, a, was a fantastic procurement process, very detailed from a regulatory perspective, very detailed from a technical perspective, audits, um, financial performance monitoring. It was a proper, proper procurement process. Um, so I'd expect any contracts that fall out from there won't be subject to be challenged um, by the likes of the GLP. Um, and will be based on real demand that the, the government is seeing now. So, you know, if we were going for a surge contract, that would be because there's surge amount of tests in the marketplace. Um, so hopefully we won't have any of the challenges um, that um, some of our fellow industry companies have had. Um, Quentin's asked a question around product launches from Oxford Nanopore and Gene Drive. How does that affect the markets we operate in? Well, I think, you know, this market is a very busy market to be in right now. There's never been a better time to be in diagnostics. Um, and we're, we're seeing that at the, at the moment. And the more products and services that come out there, the bigger the industry grows. 
I'd still like to think that the fact that Boots chose our product over anybody else's shows where we are from a retailer perspective. I'd still like to think that we were one of only three companies that won all four of the government frameworks um, should define our capability and our product efficacy. So we welcome competition um, because, as I said, it, it makes the, the industry bigger and more valuable. Uh, but I'm not concerned about competing head to head with, with that competition. Um, Taiwan investment, we have a contingency plan if there's any geopolitical risk with China. Um, well, we've got facility in Singapore, um, and those two parts of the world work very closely together. Um, our new head of business um, that we're currently recruiting will be based in that region. So there would be a plan if, if there was particular geopolitical challenges um, that would come, come our way. Um, how big do you expect the U.S. market to be? Um, for us, okay, well, well, overall, I think the market in the U.S. will triple in the next three years. Um, the government have come out and advised that every new pregnant mum should have an NIPT test. Um, at a time when the central laboratories where about 80% of these tests would, would routinely go are already full of COVID tests. So I think the market is expanding exponentially. Um, we are the only one that offers an NGS system that we can put into our customers' hands. So rather than them relying on a big central lab, they can take control of the NIPT testing themselves. We estimate there are between 30 and 35 hospitals, laboratories that would benefit and, and be open for the kind of service that we provide. So that's our addressable market. And I think you wouldn't be looking at, at, at installing one of our systems if you were doing anything less than 50,000 samples a year. So hopefully that gives you a bit more flavor on the on the size of, of the market. Um, are there plans to enter any other global markets with our NIPT tests? Um, I suppose the one that's left off the list at the moment is China. Um, and the, the challenge with China is it's, it's a very well-served market from in-house and in-country testing providers. But that's the only market that we haven't really made a big inroad into yet. And I would expect us to, to look at that on the next three year horizon strategically. That's the fastest growing healthcare market. But I think the, the inroads we've made in Japan, Australia, America, Canada, you know, uh, Northern Europe and, and anywhere outside of the UK and France, I think this year. And, and given the geographical map I put up earlier on in the deck, hopefully, Steve, you can see that we're making really strong progress there. Uh, given that you feel the company share price is low, would you consider a, a, a share buyback scheme? I think Barry's just told me I'm not allowed to talk about share price, um, so I'll avoid that question. Um, okay, Raj is asking, is there a Wall Street listed on the card for your gene? Well, hey, this came up one of our last presentations, and I think I handed over to Barry, and we said possibly, and then the rumor mill went mad. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, Wall Street is interesting. Um, their evaluation for U.S. companies is a lot, lot higher. They seem to have a more specialized investor community. It's certainly around healthcare and diagnostics. I think to get into that uh, market position, you have to have some pretty decent percentage of your revenues coming from the U.S. So, you know, as we look to expand our U.S. offering uh, and broaden our customer base and the revenues that we get from that market, um, watch this space, I would say. It's, it's certainly open for us. Um, when the exclusivity deal with Thermo Fisher finishes, will I own an X become the favorite NIPT offering globally? Brilliant question. Um, I like the fact, Stephen, that we're platform agnostic and we have both options because there will always be partners that prefer Illumina. There will always be partners that prefer Thermo or have already invested in that capability. So I hope that we will always be platform agnostic. Um, I think, you know, the larger the customer may want to decide to move to the Ionor NX because it has more processing capability. It's a more modern, up-to-date system. Um, but I would eventually like, you know, hopefully like to see us being able to supply both platforms. But given the um, global market coverage that the Illumina IP covers, I think it would be fair to say that the majority of our business in the future, you know, new business will certainly come on the Illumina platform. Um, Roger, again, when will the new analyst report be available? Um, as I said, I think we're going to use the AGM as an opportunity to take stock, really evaluate what's happened, um, report numbers that have been, not numbers that we hope um, to achieve. Um, so hopefully towards the end of September, early October, um, we get an analyst report out. But, you know, probably worth saying that we're happy with the consensus of 25 million up there at the moment if you extrapolate our first quarter. Uh, we'll show you why we get confidence, especially as our first quarter is normally our smallest quarter of the year. I um, appreciate you may not wish to upgrade analyst focus until more certainty, but on a scale of 1 to 10, with 10 being very, how confident are you of delivering the 25 million for FY21-22? Um, I think I just made that statement before I read your question, uh, to be honest, so I, it, it would be a high number um, based on what we see today. So, unbelievably, 
we've entered, we've emptied the questions uh, with a couple of minutes to go. So you, you've been fantastic, Lynn Barry. Thank you so much. As always, you've been hugely generous with your time. And you've answered every single question we've had come through. So thank you very much indeed. Um, on that basis, Lynn, perhaps I could just ask you for a few final words just before we redirect the uh, investors to give you some feedback, please. Yeah, we look forward to updating you all in September again, guys. And thank you for all your support and sticking with us with what's been, you know, for the very long term shareholders, you know, a very interesting journey. Um, but I came on board with a three to five year plan. I'm delighted at where we are after three years. And I think the next two years are where we really take off as a business. So thank you for your continued support. It's very, very much appreciated. That's fantastic. Um, Lynn, Barry, thanks again for updating investors today. Could I please ask investors not to close the session and should be automatically redirected for the opportunity to provide your feedback in order that the team can better understand your views and expectations. This will only take a few moments to complete and is greatly valued by the company. On behalf of the management team of Georgian Health PLC, we'd like to thank you for attending today's presentation. That now concludes today's session. Thank you and good afternoon.